recording. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. Thank you for joining us for today's event, the Concordia three minute thesis competition. Now to help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Four Space, and we are located here on unceded Indigenous lands in Chichage, Montreal. In the Four Space, we work with our university community to help mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities that examine research questions, projects, things in development across the university. And we're running this event today as a live stream Zoom meeting. Uh, we welcome any comments or questions in the chat. We'll do our best with those for those of you in the space as well. Uh, we're going to not have questions today. Uh, with that, it's very much my pleasure to hand things over to Concordia Public Scholar and our host for today, Maxine Yanochili. Maxine, welcome back. Thank you, Douglas. And hello, everyone. My name is Maxine Yanochili, and welcome to the 2024 Concordia 3MT competition. I'll be your master of ceremonies for today. So two years ago, I participated in this very competition and I genuinely enjoyed the experience. One that pushes students out of the technical details of our research and encourages us to become storytellers. Since then, I've had the privilege of serving as a coach for the last two cohorts and emceeing this live event. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with all the participants this year, learn about their different research and projects and ambitions. To you, our presenters, I want to encourage you all to acknowledge all the hard work that you put into this so far and make the most out of this valuable opportunity to share your passion with others. So my advice for you right now is to take a moment to breathe and become present in this moment and really try enjoying this experience as much as possible. On that note, I want to thank you all, both our in-person and virtual audience, for being here today to support our 3MT finalists today. Now, a brief overview of the program we have for you today. In just a moment, we're gonna have a welcome address by Concordia's Associate Dean of Academic Programs and Development, which will then be followed by two rounds of eight presentations each with a five minute break in between, followed by a voting period for the People's Choice Award, which will take place both over Zoom and in person. Um, I'm going to provide instructions and signal when this happens for you when that time comes. Now, once voting for the People's Choice Awards closes, and while the judges then take the time to deliberate our competition winners, we're going to have a live Q&A um, with our presenters to really get to know them a bit, a bit better, their research and their 3MT experience. So I'm going to ask everyone here um, in our audience to please keep your questions um, for this allotted period at the end. Finally, after the judges deliberate, we're gonna announce the winners and you're all invited to stay afterwards to mingle and enjoy a little bite and refreshments. I was told there will be cupcakes. I would now like to thank, uh, sorry, I would now like to invite Dr. Ra Rachel Berger, Associate Dean of Academic Programs and Development to say a few words. Thanks, Maxine. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, we're delighted to welcome you, com, welcome you to the 13th edition of the three-minute thesis competition at Concordia University. Over the past 13 years, the three-minute thesis competition has brought much pride to Concordia. Just last year, we had Ria Datta, our three-minute thesis champion representing Concordia and Canada at the North American level. We, myself included, have had the pleasure of coaching students on the research pitch and being at the other side of the table judging their communication skills. We have watched our students blossom from jargon-riddled, rambling, cryptic scripts to create compelling, thought-provoking stories. Thank you to all our coaches over the years. For those listeners who are tuning in to their first three-minute thesis competition, I would like to take a moment to provide a little background on this international event. This annual competition started at the University of Queensland in 2008, but it quickly became a worldwide event. Now this competition is held in approximately, approximately 900 universities in 85 countries. The competition has also been adapted to other languages, including the French version, Ma thèse en 180 secondes. The challenge of the three-minute thesis program is for graduate students to be clearly to clearly communicate the essence and importance of their research to a non-specialist audience with just one static PowerPoint slide. 
Imagine after spending months or even years and often years of tolling away at your research, then having to squeeze it into a three minute summary without diluting it or omitting major points, a challenge worthy of any mind and certainly one that I would fail. According to the University of Queensland, it takes almost nine hours to present an 80,000 word thesis. And despite our growing ability to sit through nine hours of the latest Netflix series, I doubt anyone is up for a nine hour thesis presentation today. This year, we invited all our graduate students to participate in this competition. 26 students took us off on the offer and joined the 3MT coaching, but only 16 finalists have made it to today's competition. After the presentation, our judges will select a winner in both the master's and doctoral categories. You, the audience, will also have the opportunity to vote for a People's Choice Award, which Maxine will explain more after the participants' presentations. From our finalists, the judges will select one student to represent Concordia University at the Northeastern Association of Graduate Studies, a 3MT computation in, competition in May, and the CAGS, the Canadian Association of Graduate Studies, 3MT Eastern Regional Final Competition in June. I salute all the participants for their courage to accept this in-person challenge. I wish them the best of luck in their time to shine. Now I'll invite Maxine, a previous three-minute thesis winner and coach, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Storyteller Finalist and Master of Ceremonies today to introduce our judges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Roger. I'm now gonna direct your attention to our panel of esteemed judges joining us this afternoon who have graciously accepted the responsibility of selecting today's winners. May I please ask you to come to the front? So our first judge, Alexis Gateman, is a Concordia alumni and is now the Regional Vice President for Eastern Canada at Make-A-Wish Canada, with over 18 years experience in the nonprofit se sector. Specializing in both legacy and major gifts, strategic planning and operational growth, she has a proven track record in the healthcare, higher education and humanitarian sectors. A lifelong learner, she seeks out positive change and a desire to better our communities. Alexis is the president of the Association of Fundraising Professionals and has completed, completed her executive MBA with McGill and Asher C in 2021. Her second judge is Mamoun Medraj. Mamoun is a professor at the Mechanical, Industrial and Aerospace Engineering Department here at Concord University, currently serving as the Associate of Recruitments and Awards at the School of Graduate Studies. His research focuses on the area of materials development and testing for aerospace and energy applications. And finally, our third judge is Sammy Lee. Sammy is the co-creator of InnovaTank and co-chair at the World Case Committee. Sammy is an award-winning researcher and educator specializing in innovation within the realms of data analytics and project management. With a robust background as a project manager and technology lead in both industry and academia, Sammy is also a seasoned professor in analytics. Having participated in over 12 international and national competitions, she brings a wealth of practical experience to her role. Sammy holds an MDA with a focus on strategy and competition, complemented by a PhD in immersive learning and technological processes. Recognized for her teaching innovation and distinguished research, she leads InnovaTank, orchestrating hands-on learning experiences for students through the integration of that data analytics and collaborative ventures with corporate enti entities. We thank you all for your time this afternoon and are really honored um, to have you as our judges today. Go ahead, please. All right, so before we begin with today's presentations, I do wanna highlight the competition overview and its rules, as well as provide a bit of information as to how the presenters will be judged. So the overall aim of 3MT is to celebrate student-led research. It provides a concrete opportunity to help students develop their presentation and communication skills by challenging them to convey their work and its significance in an accessible way in three minutes. So 3MT is a global competition that's held annually at over 900 institutions over more than 85 countries. And the competition does involve some rules. So participants are only allowed one static slide that will be displayed on the screen right here. 
No animations, no use of additional electronics, uh, media or props are allowed. The participants have a maximum of three minutes to present their research. Any presentation that exceeds the three minutes will automatically be disqualified. And the judge's decision is a final one. Judging will be based on two categories of criteria. So the first, comprehension and content. So did the presenter provide clear motivation and background for their work? Were the research approach and findings clear? Did the presenter clearly convey the potential impact of their research? And the second category is engagement and communication. So the delivery of the presentation, essentially. Was it understandable and accessible for a general audience? To what extent did the slide complement the presentation? And did the presenter capture and maintain the audience's attention throughout? And finally, the prizes. The best score in the master's and doctoral categories will each receive an award of $750. And the People's Choice will receive an, an, an additional award of $250. We're going to encourage you all to share your impressions today. So support and promote each other on social media using the hashtags 3MTCU2024 and Canada3MT. Now, without further ado, let's get started with the presentations. We have a total of 16 presenters, 11 in the master's category and five in the doctoral category. We'll have two rounds of eight presentation, which will include presenters from both of these categories. Keep an eye out for your favorite presenter that you'll get a chance to vote for at the People's Choice Selection at the very end of all the presentations. Now, as we get ready for our first presenter, let's put our hands together in encouragement to wish all of our participants a genuine good luck. Our first presenter is Arindam Moore from the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. Arindam is pursuing a master's in mechanical engineering. His thesis title is Towards the Development of a Comprehensive SPS Coding Buildup Model. And three minute thesis title is Codings, Invisible but Important. Good luck, Arindam. So do you remember the last time that you painted your room? Essentially, a paint is a coating, because by definition, a coating is any covering that is applied to the surface of another object. To the human eye, all coatings look just the same. Under a microscope, however, different coatings can look very different based on their microstructures. A microstructure is just the fashion in which a material's particles are arranged. Different microstructures have different properties, hence it is very important to know how a microstructure behaves if you are a manufacturer for you to ensure that your product works as intended. Now, it doesn't sound much of a big deal, does it? Well, let me give you an example. Often in plan engines, the, te the temperatures can reach upwards of 1000 degrees Celsius due to the combustion of fuel. Now, these temperatures are enough to melt the components inside of an engine and also those that are adjacent to it. Now, we wouldn't want that to happen in a plane that we are traveling in, right? So what, what can we do? We could, of course, coat the components with a coating that is thermal resistant or that has a resistance to heat. In this particular case, we would use TBCs or thermal barrier coatings. As the name suggests, these coatings are coatings that act as a thermal barrier or that prevent the transfer of heat. So as I was saying earlier, it is important for you to understand how a microstructure behaves to ensure that your product works as intended and there are many ways to do that. One of the traditional ways is by physical experimentation, but that's expensive because you need a physical space, you need infrastructure, you need skilled technicians, and you also need a lot of time at hand. Now, time and more importantly, uh, money are both luxuries that not many industries have. So is there a faster, cheaper way to not just verify how a microstructure behaves, but also optimize the characteristics of that coating to ensure that the product works in the best possible manner. I think that there is. What we could do is that we could make a computer program that not just uh, helps you do it, helps you verify the microstructure behavior, but also, as I mentioned, optimize its characteristics by 
uh, simulating the physical process of the development of a coating. It would not just help us save a lot of time, but it would also help us save money because then you could use that uh, program to tweak parameters here and there until you get the coating that you desire. It would not just, uh, as I mentioned, save us time and money, but also give us products that just work a lot better. Isn't that something we want? Thank you very much. Thank you, Arindam. Our next presenter is Emma Shawen Chen from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Emma's pursuing a PhD in Health and Exercise Science. Emma's thesis title is Investigating Fall Prevention for Older Women Using Various Styles of Online Dance Classes and Exploring Impacts on Modifiable Risk Factors Across Sensory, Cognitive, and Physical Domains. And three minute thesis title is Ballet for Balance. Accessible Online Fall Prevention. Good luck, Emma. In our cold and icy winters, do you worry about falling? I know I do, and so does my friend Anita. Anita is 73, and in the past couple of years, she experienced some falls, which is common. One in three adults above the age of 65 will fall every year, and the injuries that result, such as broken bones, hip fractures, and concussions, can be hard to bounce back from and they prompt many from making the transition from living at home to an assisted living center, representing a major loss of independence. Now, Anita knew that one of the reasons she was losing her balance is that she was losing strength with age. While a loss of strength can be prevented with exercise, only 4% of older women meet the Canadian physical activity guidelines. Exercise may be inaccessible due to living in a remote location, lack of access to transport, or in Anita's case, primary caregiver roles at home. As a primary caregiver, taking the one to two hours to drive to the gym and do class is just too much time away from family. But luckily for Anita, my research may offer a solution. I'm interested in creating accessible online fall prevention programs using dance. Now you may be wondering, why dance? But dancers are known to have great body awareness, balance, and strength. Just think of the ballerina who's turning on the tip of her toe. I'm trying to harness the benefits of ballet to increase physical activity levels and create a fun fall prevention program. So in March 2020, I started teaching my online dance classes twice a week over Zoom. And to make sure our program was working, I created a simple online test of balance. I had our participants stand as still as they could in front of their webcam for 30 seconds, and I was able to track how much they moved. Now I know, standing still sounds very simple. But whenever we stand still, we always have a little bit of movement, which we call sway. And we expect that if our balance improves, this sway becomes smaller, which is exactly what we found. So after 12 weeks, sway went from five centimeters all the way down to one, representing a major reduction in our fall risk. And because our program was online, we are able to reach out to lots of women like Anita who couldn't access traditional in-person fall prevention programming. We had Lucy, who's immunocompromised and a bit COVID anxious, Manon, who lived in rural Quebec, and Agnes, who just wanted to try something new. I've been very grateful over the past three years to build a community of over 70 older women from Hamilton, Ontario to saint sauveur Quebec, and the success and the feedback has allowed us to keep going for over seven semesters. Using online dance classes has proven to be a great way to improve balance. And in case you're still wondering, Anita is still dancing and she hasn't fallen since. Thank you, Emma. Our next presenter is Nikki Monjazeb from the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. Nikki's pursuing a master's in computer science. Her thesis title is Automated Data Preparation Using Graph Neural Networks. And three-minute thesis title is A Recipe for Quality Data. Good luck, Nikki. In 2019, a Tesla on autopilot crashed into a white truck, killing its passenger. This was due to the autopilot's inability to distinguish between the white truck and the sky, as it had not seen such a situation during its training. Technologies like self-driving cars or recommendation algorithms on Amazon or Netflix may seem magical, 
But behind every driving decision or recommendation, there's a model that has seen millions of examples to train it to be able to detect objects or learn people's tastes. These examples are called training data. And when our training data is faulty or incomplete, tragedies like the Tesla accident can happen. And it's not just Tesla. According to IBM, the yearly cost of poor quality data in the US alone is $3 trillion. The numbers are clear. We need a better way to prepare high quality training data. And my research does just that by providing a recipe for data preparation. What do I mean of a recipe for data preparation? Well, as it turns out, the process of an expert preparing high quality training data is a lot like the process of a chef preparing a meal. A chef will clean her ingredients to make sure that they're safe for consumption. Our experts clean their data to make sure that it's complete. A chef will transform her ingredients by slice, dice, and spicing them to enhance their flavor and texture. Our experts transform their data into more understandable formats for their models. And just like you can find a chef's recipe on cooking websites, you can find our experts' code on code sharing websites. But what if you want to make a meal for which there is no recipe? Well, you can either make your own, in which case you'll try different things, make a few mistakes, and risk making a meal that doesn't taste quite right. Or you can look for recipes for similar meals and combine their best parts, which is exactly how my system provides a recipe for data preparation. It extracts the cleaning and transformation techniques used in the code on culture and websites and learns from them. This way, it can apply similar techniques to any new training data we might have, simplifying the data preparation process, cutting costs, and possibly saving lives. Because you can live with a less than perfect meal, but can you live with a less than perfect autopilot? Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Our next presenter is Abu Saleh Mohamed Zouayed from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Abu is pursuing a PhD in social and cultural analysis. Abu's thesis title is Making of Men in Transnational Spaces, Navigating the Interaction Between Transnational Migration and the Construction of Masculinities Among Bangladeshi Men Living in Canada. And his three minute thesis title is Hidden Stories, Untold Pressures. Good luck, Abu. Close your eyes and imagine moving to a new country. Everything you know is left behind. It's scary, exciting, confusing. Now imagine being a man in this scenario, traditionally seen as the pillar of strength, the provider. Suddenly the whole ground beneath your feet felt shaky because you are not just adjusting to a new place. You are dealing with new roles, new expectations, and yes, new gender dynamics. According to the last Canadian census, one in every four Canadians were born outside Canada, and almost 48% of them are men. However, in the last 24 years, only 39 journal articles address the evolving data role of migrant men in Canada, showing us a huge research gap in this area. So my research looks at migrant Bangladeshi men in Canada to see how their idea of gender changed after migration. I've interviewed 24 Bangladeshi men across Canada from different generations with different socio-demographic background, different migration experiences, and different length of stay to see what it means to be a migrant man in Canada. You see, migrant Bangladeshi men in Canada face a unique set of pressures, the intense burden of financial responsibilities, the struggle to adapt to unfamiliar gender norms, and the risk of exploitation due to their marginal status. However, the dominant perception of men as neutral actors mask all their vulnerabilities and the pressures they face. So I aim to dismantle this myth of emotionless provider, showing their true vulnerabilities and the pressures they face adapting to these new norms. By understanding their true needs, we can craft targeted policies that truly support them, not just assume they're resilient by default. Besides, it will also help researchers to understand the broader impact of migration on Canadian masculinities. For too long, migrant men's gendered experience in Canada have remained hidden. Today, I urge you to open your hearts and minds to understand 
and recognize the richness they bring to the tapestry of Canadian masculinities. Let their stories ignite your empathy, challenge your assumptions, and guide us towards a more equitable society that celebrates diversity. And remember, masculinities are as diverse as the men who embody them. Thank you. Thank you, Abu. Our next presenter is Monali Patel from the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. Monali is pursuing a master's in chemical engineering. Her thesis title is Exploring Sustainable Production Pathways for Chemical Industries. And three minute thesis title is Greening the Chemical Industry, Brightening Our Future. Good luck, Monali. Thank you. Take this challenge. Spend a day of 24 hours without using plastic. Imagine, no computers, laptops, mobile phones, food containers, garbage bins, and in fact, the chair that you are sitting on. Even more, plastic has been found there in the bodies of penguins in the Antarctica. But where does this plastics come from? Petroleum, that gives tons of pollutions and contributing to the climate change. So, what is the ultimate solution? Fortunately, we have a strong renewable replacement of petroleum. <coughs> that is biomass. Now, what is biomass? Anything that is green and woody from nature, just like trees, plants, and agriculture waste. But imagine biomass like sugarcane and corn can easily transform into the plastic but we humans are consuming them as a food. If we make plastic from that, it can disrupt our food supply. And so that process is also costly. So there is another kind of biomass, which is completely a waste. Making plastic from that is profitable, but that technology is not yet fully developed. And that is why industries today cannot produce a successful plant. Research like mine could be a very beneficial Industries today are not producing, but scientists are finding multiple different ways of producing plastic from biomass. But they are doing this all in the laboratories on a smaller scale. I gather these experimental data and create a database. And then I use a special tool to model this database. This special tool has a lot of capabilities. It compares all these different options and finds the best way to make the plastic. So that best way will also be best in energy savings and minimum use of resources like electricity and water and also cost effective. So what does that mean? This means research like this can provide support to take some crucial decisions to the industries who want to produce sustainable products. And if they do that, then using those sustainable products, sustainable bioplastic, in the future, you and I, we all can create a sustainable future for our upcoming generations. Thank you. Thank you, Monali. Our next presenter is Jeremy Pomerlo from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Jeremy is pursuing a master's in health and exercise science. His thesis title is The Evolution of Functional Brain Networks Throughout a Stationary Cycling Task in Individuals with and Without Concussions. And three-minute thesis title is Mapping the Injured Brain During Exercise. Good luck, Jeremy. I think it's safe to say that most of us here have had a hangover before. If you haven't, well then, you're not missing out on much. It's not a feeling worth experiencing. But for those who can relate, maybe you had awful headaches, nausea, or had sensitivity to light and sound. Maybe you felt irritable, had trouble thinking, and you just wanted to rest in a dark room all day. Or maybe you even woke up dazed with no memory of how you got there. Whatever your experience may have been, I think we can all agree it's quite the unpleasant one that we'd all prefer to avoid. Now picture having those awful and debilitating feelings for extended periods of time. Maybe a couple days, a few weeks, even years. 
Well, unfortunately, that terrible thought is a reality for many people with concussions. In North America, it's estimated that between 1.8 and 4 million sports-related concussions occur each year, and that up to 40% of those will have symptoms that last for more than four weeks. How would you cope if you had a hangover that long? Now, as recently as 10 years ago, the primary way doctors would treat concussions is by prescribing rest in a dark room and just telling you to wait it out. However, recent evidence suggests that light to moderate intensity aerobic exercise should be performed shortly after a concussion as it can help improve recovery outcomes. That is doing things like walking, biking, or jogging at levels where it's too difficult for you to sing, but easy enough for you to hold a conversation. While more and more studies are coming out and saying that exercise is medicine for concussions, we still don't know exactly why that is. In other words, we know the answers, but we can't show our work. As an exercise physiologist, it's my job to use science and exercise to help people manage their conditions and their injuries. Um, so while knowing that exercise is beneficial for to help treat concussions is a good start, knowing Knowing uh, the reasons why that is, is beneficial uh, for people like me to help treat people with concussions. That's why in my research, I'll be putting people with and without concussions through an exercise test on a stationary bike while they wear a headset that will measure blood flow and electrical activity in the brain. Then I will be mapping out the connections in the brain that are different between people with and without concussions. And maybe with the results from this project, we can begin to understand exactly how exercise is benefiting the injured brain. And if we know the mechanisms behind why it's helping, then maybe other treatments can be developed that don't involve exercising. Because after all, who would want to go out and exercise when they feel like they're hungover? Thank you, Jeremy. Our next presenter is Aline Kansabedian from the John Mosen School of Business. Aline is pursuing a PhD in Management Organizational Behavior. Her thesis title is Mindfulness Meets Burnout. Does Diversity Matter? And her three-minute thesis title is Are You Burning Out Differently? So look, Aline. Imagine being surrounded by noise every day the volume steadily increasing until it's overwhelming and deafening. We all face stressors in our lives, just like these never ending noises. Now picture Rick and Mary, two persons from different ethnicity, age and gender. They both face the same persistent pressure and yet Rick reaches a breaking point a bit earlier than Mary. Why? Because our background influence how we handle stress. Our ethnicity, age, and gender play a significant role in shaping how we deal with the stressors in our lives, affecting how we experience burnout. These stressors are like turning up the volume until you just can't take it. And the degree of resilience is different from one another, considering our ethnic, age, and gender diversity. But there's a way to handle all that noise or even turn it down. Mindfulness offers a way to regulate the noise, to find moments of quiet within the chaos. Mindfulness practices are simple techniques that help you focus your attention on the present moment. By practicing mindfulness, these stressors don't turn up the volume until it's unbearable. The key is to tailor these techniques to each individual, considering their distinct background. Now, research often examines the relationships between burnout, mindfulness, and diversity separately. I emphasize the necessity for simultaneous exploration of this trio over time. Uh, my work starts with an experiment on sports professionals followed by another study to, to generalize the findings to a larger population. 
I aim to introduce another lens to the dynamics of burnout, exploring how mindfulness, embracing diversity can make a difference. My research will empower organizations, managers, and employees, but mostly will help people help themselves with customized strategies. By integrating mindfulness practices tailored to our unique differences, we can effectively mitigate burnout. So it's not a one size fits all. You get to decide the, the flavors of your own recipe. So instead of allowing the noise to escalate, let's try to regulate it or turn it down. Thank you. Thank you, Aline. Our next presenter is Morgan Rowe from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Morgan's pursuing a master's in biochemistry. Her thesis title is Molecular Dynamics, Molecular Dynamics Simulations of Lysozymes Thermal Stability in Carbohydrate Solutions. And her three minute thesis title is Sweeter Vaccine Formulations. Good luck, Morgan. Delivering life-saving vaccines to the most remote regions of the world presents a formidable challenge. Vaccines require storage at temperatures as low as minus 80 degrees Celsius. Just like ice begins to melt, the active components in vaccines, called biomolecules, begin to degrade at room temperature. The key to overcoming this obstacle lies in an unexpected but familiar ingredient, sugar. Yes, the sugar that you add to your morning coffee can stabilize biomolecules, ensuring that they stay folded. This folded state is necessary for its function. It's just like being at a credit concert. You can't unfold your arms the same way the biomolecule cannot unfold when crowded by the sugar. This stabilizing potential of sugars is currently being used to stabilize pharmaceuticals. My research delves deeper into this specialized application, going beyond the traditional sugars, comparing different mixtures and concentrations. The different mixtures and concentrations could be tested in a lab, but that would take a lot of time and resources. So I use high performance computing to simulate how the biomolecule interacts with the sugar at the molecular level. To simulate the biomolecule, we need to predict how the atoms in the biomolecule are moving relative to each other. The movement is modeled based on a set of physical laws, much like the laws that govern the attraction and the repulsion of magnets, or the laws that describe how apples fall from trees. The computer will solve these equations for every atom at every time step, producing our simulation. Now, the simulation time doesn't equate to our real world time. Instead, it allows us to compress potentially years of lab work into seconds of simulation. The best sugar conditions based off of my simulations can then be uh, later validated in the lab. So through the collaboration of computing and lab experiments, we're initiating new pathways to global health equity. Temperature stable vaccines could revolutionize vaccine distribution, allowing us to reach every corner of the world, especially in areas that don't have the infrastructure to support deep freeze systems. In turn, vaccine rates will increase, disease spread will be reduced, and more lives will be saved. Thank you, Morgan. Um, and that concludes the first round of our presentation. So thank you to all our presenters so far. Great job, everybody. We're now gonna take just a few moments for a little break and let our brains absorb everything that we just learned. For those in person, there is some coffee, tea, and water um, on the other side. Feel free to serve yourselves. For those watching online, we're gonna be right back in um, for the second round of presentation in exactly five minutes. See you in a bit.
a minute. So if you can start slowly heading back to your seats and I'll see you in one minute. Where the waste or the thinking getting laid eyes wide awake, mind in the maze, run the find and the escape room. You never ran out of space. So I turned around and ended up to face it. Even though I change the same low person. When you come home, I'll be waiting. <laughs> All right, everyone. We're just about ready to get started again. So thank you all for your attention and engagement up to this point. We're ready to move on to our next round of presentations. In this round, we have another eight presenters. And after our last final one, we will follow up with the voting, voting session for the People's Choice Award, which will be at which point you'll be able to vote for your favorite presenter out of all of the 16. So let's get right back into it then. Our next presenter is Megan McManus from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Megan is pursuing a master's in health and exercise science. Her thesis title is Long-Term Assessment of Cardiac and Behavioral Phenotypes in Mice with Chronic Heart Failure. And her three minute thesis title is Beating Hearts, Broken Spirits, The Link Between Cardiovascular Health and depression. Good luck, Megan. Taking care of a plant seems easy when you think about it. Step one, buy the plant. Step two, the soil. And step three, consistently water it, right? Fortunately, it's the watering step that we often forget. And the lack of care makes the leaves wilt. Just like water, blood serves a similar role and nourishes brain tissue. So interestingly, it's believed that reduced blood flow causes structural changes in the brain, contributing to the development of depression. Think of your brain as the basil plant in your kitchen. Yeah, you know the one that you haven't been watering? Its leaves are probably looking a little sad. In this case, the wilting represents depression and the lack of water is poor blood supply. This is detrimental to your brain cells because they're not receiving the oxygen they need to thrive, bringing me to the focus of my research. Understanding how cardiovascular disease causes alterations in the brain leading to depression. This research is essential because for every eight people sitting in this room, at least one will severely suffer with their mental health over a lifetime. And for those with cardiovascular disease, this risk multiplies by three due to heart dysfunction. Just like wanting to understand why not watering the basil plant is causing it to wilt, my research aims to establish foundational knowledge about the effects of heart dysfunction on the brain. This understanding can lead to the development of new medications for depression, which is essential considering that the current treatment options do not show the desired effects in this population. To mimic human conditions, I will use mice to understand how depression develops in heart disease by looking at their self-care habits and motivation. Then I will relate the results to the severity of the heart dysfunction using exercise tests, ultrasound heart imaging, and brain blood flow measurements. At the end of the study, I'll compare groups with and without heart disease by looking at their brain and heart tissue. This comparison will help identify specific cellular mechanisms that are leading to different depression risk factors and in turn help find new treatments. Since a diagnosis with both heart and brain conditions can significantly worsen health outcomes, 
We need new information about the hard brain relationship to improve every patient's quality of life. Just like the basil plant, your body needs care. Because let's not forget, we all have a brain, we all have a heart, and these diseases can affect anyone. Thank you, Megan. Our next presenter is Sophie Turner from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Sophie's pursuing a master's in history. Her thesis title is Cultivating Colonialism, the 18th century medical marketplace's response to newly introduced botanical medicine in London. And three minute thesis title is Botanical Medicine in 18th century London. Good luck, Sophie. When was the last time you thought about where your medicine comes from? How far did this medicine travel to get into your hands? How many people along the way helped you to feel better? My research into the 18th century medical marketplace studies how newly introduced botanical medicine entered and was consumed in the medical marketplace. The medical marketplace of the 18th century in London was not that different from the medical marketplace that we see today. We have hospitals, some were subsidized, some were even free healthcare. We had physicians, both general and specialized. We had apothecaries, which worked very similar to going to the Jean Coutu or the Pharma Prix around the corner. You bring them your prescription, they fill it, and you pick it up. We also had marketplaces where you could buy botanical medicine, or you could grow it at home and prepare it. And of course, there's the age-old tradition of asking your mom what to do and following her directions. <laughs> Currently, my slide is open to a few medical plants that come from Elizabeth Blackwell's A Curious Herbal. An herbal is a book of plants that were used specifically for medicine. She actually illustrated these from live specimens, and it was one of the first examples of its kind. Instead of having somebody describe the plant to an artist, she was an artist who acquired live samples from London and illustrated them and then hand colored them. This helped especially in the identification and distribution of medical botanical medicine. We have chamomile, which was incredibly good for stomach ailments and colic, as she notes, and licorice, which was actually imported to England, was incredibly good for distresses of the lungs and for sore throats, which is incredibly pertinent as we look towards a post-COVID-19 world. We're also seeing the shift, as we did in the 1700s, from a curative medical marketplace to a preventative medical marketplace, where we're looking at how we're moving from curing really significant ailments and illnesses that affect your daily life towards more improving the quality of your life. Think of it as if you hurt your leg when you were at walking. If you took the rest of the day off to care for yourself, you might have the chance to recover without any further ailments. Whereas if you push yourself, you could end up spraining or even tearing your muscle, which would require further medical intervention. So why is this important? Well, we know that we have hundreds of years of medical history and we can use that to learn from the past and possibly reinvent or reintroduce botanical medicine back into the current system. So I'll ask you again, where does your medicine come from? Thank you, Sophie. Our next presenter is Mehdi Shamer from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Mehdi is pursuing a PhD in physics. His thesis title is Computational Design and Characterization of Bimetallic Allo Alloy Catalysts for the Nitrogen Reduction Reaction. And three minute thesis title is Make Every Model Count for the Planet. Good luck, Mehdi. What is the primary concern of living creatures? Survival? We all share an inner drive to survive, and for survival, we need food. Producing food for almost 9 billion people is impossible without using fertilizers. Ammonia is a key ingredient in fertilizers and a cornerstone in modern agriculture. Unfortunately, the industrial production of ammonia emits more than 500 million tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Clearly, we are damaging the environment to produce food. So we should care, and we should care now. And remember, every step counts. What are the solutions? One of them is the nitrogen reduction reaction. Let's call it NRR. NRR uses renewable energy as a source to produce ammonia. 
So how much greenhouse gas does NRR produce? None. This is perfect. But the challenge with NRR is that it cannot satisfy the global need without an optimum catalyst. And what's a catalyst? A substance that makes a reaction occur faster without being consumed in the reaction. My research is to find that optimum catalyst for NRR and increase scalability. In general, we have two approaches to design a catalyst. We could do try and error experimentations, which are time consuming and costly, or we can use computers to model the catalyst and study its properties. In this way, we can investigate different catalysts in a faster, cheaper, and controlled way. In my research, we use simulation methods to dive deep into the atom's world and study the behaviors and interactions of the electrons in the catalyst. What is the outcome? The electrical properties of the catalyst, which with this, we can estimate its performance for NRR. Fancy. But of course, experiments should validate computational predictions in practice. And the good news is that our experimental collaborators were able to produce ammonia using silver-based alloys predicted by my computational approach. In a world striving for sustainability, NRR stands as a beacon of hope. By combining computational and experimental studies, we aim to find that optimum catalyst for NRR, produce environmentally friendly ammonia for fertilizers, and pave the way for a greener future. Thank you. Thank you, Mehdi. Our next presenter is Armin Nebai from the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. Armin is pursuing a master's in computer science. His thesis title is Enhancing Facial Recognition, Enhancing Facial Expression Recognition with a Multi-Scale Deep CNN Model Using Modified Softmax Loss and Atom Optimizer. And his three-minute thesis title is Optimizing Emotion Detection, Advanced Multi-Scale CNNS with enhanced softmax and Adam. Good luck, Armin. The push for reliable intelligence systems goes hand in hand with advancements in artificial intelligence. Take emotion detection systems, for instance. They read our facial expression and the movements to guess how we are feeling, recognizing key emotions like happiness, anger, or fear. Consider Alex who is not himself today, is a smart home system with its facial expression tech spots subtle shifts in his facial expression, indicators of sadness or fear. It promptly responds, notifying his healthcare provider and family, ensuring he receives the timely support necessary. Real-time monitoring like this can dramatically improve quality of life. Let's make sure we use AI to simplify life, not complicate it. Also, these real-time applications should work based on accurate and reliable models. Performance enhancement of this system is where the magic happens in our field. In my thesis, I explored an AI model using convolutional neural network for recognizing facial expression to handle poor real-time performance. I improved performance of this system using a process called supervised learning. It means we carefully adjust our AI, much like tuning a guitar, to make sure it performs just right. Also, I have made enhancement by proposing three new algorithms showing their effectiveness over existing methods to better detect emotions that look the same such as telling the difference between a disgust face and a sad face. It's like giving the AI a sharper eye for detail. Then I tested this approach on facial expression benchmarks. Finally, the aim of my work was to create a reliable facial expression model. Reliability in AI is not a luxury. It's a necessity for technology to trust that has power to shape our future. And for the road ahead, the goal is to advance the standards of this framework to meet 
the today's stable systems and match them in practical everyday uses. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Our next presenter is Stephen Warsh from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Stephen is pursuing a master's in health and exercise science. His thesis title is The Effects of Virtual Reality Interventions on Attention and Pain in Healthy Baseball Athletes. And three minute thesis title is From Ow to Wow with Virtual Reality. Good luck, Stephen. On the screen, you will see an image represented uh, of an athlete in my, in my research study using virtual reality for pain relief. Now I want you to think about the last time you experienced pain. Perhaps you hurt your back shoveling the driveway or you're one of the 50 million people who live with pain each day. What do you do when you're in pain to get relief? Well, you may head to the freezer, grab a bag of ice. Well, you may head to the medicine cabinet and grab something stronger. These are not long, long lasting solutions and they come with side effects. So I returned to Concordia because I wanted to find another solution. Virtual reality is currently being used as a pain reliever tool that has already shown a 50 to 100% reduction in pain in previous research studies. Hospitals have started using it to replace epidurals for pregnant women during delivery, replacing laughing gas during routine procedure, uh, dental procedures, as well as replacing opioids for uh, burn victims. And I wanted to see if we could use it on athletes as well. So you might be asking, how does this work? Well, I want to give you a quick example. I want you to think about the last time that you were so immersed in an activity. Maybe you were reading a really good book. Maybe you were playing a game. You look down at your watch, two hours has flown by. What happened? Well, you are in what's known as a state of flow. And while the brain is an incredible thing, it has a limited capacity to process incoming information. And with pain, if we don't actually process the pain signals being received, we, we don't actually feel pain itself. So what we're basically doing with virtual reality is we're saying to the brain, hey, hey, look up here, look up here, look, 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 this amazing thing, look at this, look how cool this is. We're directing the attention up to the pain so that we distract from the pain signals being sent by the body. So how did we study this? We brought in athletes from across Quebec to, uh, to, to the lab, and we placed a cream on their leg, which induces pain and mimics injury. Very safe, don't worry. And what we did was we tracked over the course of three interventions, one was a computer task that was non-immersive, and two virtual reality baseball tasks with different difficulties, one being a practice and one being a game. And we wanted to see how their immersion and flow scores would, would compare to their pain ratings. And what we expected to see was that as their immersion increased, their pain levels would decrease. So you might be asking, why should I care about this research? Well, pain affects us all. Whether we stub our toe on the couch or recovering from surgery, pain is something that we all deal with. And I wanted to help find a better solution as a healthcare professional who treats athletes all the time in pain. Now, the next time you're in pain, while a, a virtual reality headset may not fit inside your medicine cabinet, I'm hoping it's the first thing that you will grab the next time you're in pain. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Our next presenter is Alia Nur Mohammed from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Alia is pursuing a PhD in social and cultural analysis. Her thesis title is, Am I working right now? Care, surveillance, and the experience of temporality in hybrid work. And three minute thesis title is, Hybrid work, balancing work and life. Good luck, Alia. Does anyone remember BBC Dad? Professor Robert Kelly went viral at the beginning of the pandemic when his kids came tearing into his home office during a televised interview with the BBC. His wife drags the kids out and he gets teased for not getting up. Do you remember the questions? Were you wearing any pants? Or do you remember the shade? Why isn't the nanny doing a better job taking care of the kids? He said, I didn't know what to do. Prior to March 2020, work and home were separated in time and place. This meant that people knew they were at work by the amount of time they were spending in their workplaces, which typically wasn't their homes and vice versa. However, in the pandemic, largely knowledge workers found themselves working at kitchen tables, sofas, and this was happening at the same time as people were cooking, cleaning, homeschooling, making sure elderly family were safe. Like Professor Kelly, the unpaid work of giving care suddenly became 
hyper visible. We knew it had always been there. Now it was running across your Zoom screens because the pandemic showed us that the border we thought existed between home and work hadn't been there all along. This opened conversations about flexibility, the relationship between work and home, and that elusive thing, balance. Two years into the pandemic, the common refrain was, this works. Fast forward to today. Employers from the federal government to corporations are instituting return to office mandates, effectively saying that didn't work. My research would like to follow up on the changing world of how we spend our time between home and work in search of balance. I will be conducting interviews with parents to ask them about their experiences under the new normal, hybrid work, working sometimes inside, sometimes outside the home. How do workers negotiate flexibility with employers? Does this change? Who does what when? Are there differences across gender, age, and race? What are the concerns of employers and employees? Employers say, Work belongs at work, citing concerns around culture and training. Workers respond by saying, I need flexibility, autonomy, to decide where, when, and how I work. This tug of war is new, telling us we haven't made a new normal yet. We're making it in real time. And we're only just now getting the research on what hybrid work can tell us about the relationship between home and work by focusing on the experiences of parents who juggle paid employment and unpaid care on a daily basis. My research hopes to add to a rebutting understanding of what hybrid work can tell us about how paid employment should be organized and its relationship to everyday home life. Thank you. Thank you, Alia. Our next presenter is Sho Wu from the John Molson School of Business. Sho is pursuing a PhD in business administration. Her thesis title is Two Essays on Consumer Wellbeing and Gender and Physical Freedom. And three minute thesis title is To Break Through Gender Stereotypes, Applaud Gender Transgression. Good luck, Sho. Do you know that from the moment you are born, you are given a role? This may sound like a dystopian novel, but sadly, not at all. From the very start, society imposes gender roles upon us. Women are from Venus, men from Mars, right? But what happened to those who do not conform to gender stereotypes? Despite progress, many individuals still face discrimination and even violence for challenging gender stereotypes. And this put every one of us into narrow boxes. For example, due to gender stereotypes, women feel pressure to follow unrealistic beauty standards and the men feel ashamed to seek mental health support. And in some parts of the world, transgender individuals are denied access towards essential healthcare services. This highlights that women, men, and non-binary individuals all experience pressure related to gender stereotypes, and there is an urgent need to change how we respond to people who break stereotypes to encourage diversity and inclusion. To achieve this, I propose we welcome gender transgression. But what is gender transgression? It involves violating a norm, such as men wearing makeup or women competing in bodybuilding. My research looks deep into the complexity of this phenomenon. In the lab, I analyze participants' emotional responses towards gender transgressors and to what extent they associate it with negative concept. Further, I analyze how nature and nurture jointly shape these responses. For nature, I look at testosterone levels indicated by our finger measurement, as for nurture, I analyze the impact of participants' culture background. By bringing these factors together, my research helps to understand how we define ourselves and each other. In addition, as a marketing researcher, I provide insights based on individual responses toward gender transgression, which brands and marketers who often shape consumption culture can leverage for product development with lucrative potential. Now, I urge you all to applaud gender transgression because embracing it 
fosters a more inclusive and a liberated society where everyone can thrive authentically and where gender is no longer a constraint, but a celebration of individuality. Thank you. Thank you, Shao. Our final presenter of the day is Angelica Nyanapagrasam from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Angelica is pursuing a master's in health and exercise science. Her thesis title is Acute Effects of a Resistance and Aerobic Intervention with Blood Flow Restriction on Vasodilation, Blood Flow and, mu and Muscle Oxygenation in University-Aged Individuals. And three-minute thesis title is Blood Flow Restriction, Nice or Knife? Good luck, Angelica. Cancer. Stroke diabetes, depression. These are just a few of the things that daily exercise can help prevent. Unfortunately, not everyone is able to take advantage of exercising. And that could be from a fear of getting injured, the inability to lift heavy, even the intimidation of lifting weights can hold someone back. Thankfully, there is a solution for these all too common barriers, and it's called blood flow restriction training or BFR training. With the help of a special cuff wrapped around your limb, we can restrict a percentage of your blood flow to the working muscles. This tricks your body into thinking it's working at a higher intensity than it actually is. So you get more, but with less. Think of it this way, imagine going to the gym and instead of lifting 100 pound weights, you're lifting 20 pounds of BFR and getting the same results. This is an excellent technique for those whom it may be dangerous to lift heavy, like older adults or patients rehabilitating from an injury. Even athletes have been using this technique to build muscle and avoid the fatigue from their muscles that can occur from lifting heavy. Now. This all sounds great, right? So what's the problem? Well, in reality, our knowledge of BFR training is actually limited. There is tons of research on this technique, but we still don't know its immediate effects on our bodies. And without knowing what's really happening on a physiological level, using this technique could be like trying to scratch your back with a knife. It probably feels great in the moment, but you could potentially end up stabbing yourself. That's where I come in. My research aims to look at how BFR instantly affects your blood vessels and your muscles. I'm gonna be doing this using ultrasound to look straight into our bodies and see just how our blood vessels expand and contract at different points to accommodate this change in blood flow. At the same time, I'll be using a special external sensor to monitor the oxygen levels in our muscles. And all of this while our young healthy participants strap on a BFR cuff and work out their muscles, their forearm muscles specifically. Looking at the way healthy bodies react to BFR training helps us to set up a firm base to eventually understand what's going on in unhealthy bodies. My findings will help to make BFR training safer and more accessible for people who can really benefit from it. So let's not stab ourselves in the back and let's take advantage of everything exercise has to offer. Thank you, Angelica. And that concludes our presentation. So thank you to all the presenters for their excellent talks today. We are gonna take a little break until exactly 3.20, at which point I'm gonna be providing instructions for the pre -Fulls Choice Award, which is gonna happen at that time. Um, so a quick, by another five minute break to just stretch out your limbs again. And we'll be back, I'll call you back at 319 and I'm gonna provide the people's choice instructions at that point, okay? See you back again in a bit.
Sorry, I left. We didn't know what to do. And um, so for those of you who haven't already done so over the break, it seems, <laughs> um, and you do want to vote for a people's choice, please feel free to use the ballots um, that, you, that have been circulating. They've been on your chairs in the beginning. If not, they're still um, at the front. But if you haven't already done so, feel free to fill one in and um, you can hand it to Bertie who's walking around with a little basket. For those in the Zoom room, um, you can also fill out the poll that's already been distributed during the, the little break, if you haven't already done so as well. But it seems like most of you have already jumped at the gun and did that, <laughs> which is totally fine. Um, what, so where are judges? <laughs> the judges are deliberating. <laughs> okay, great. So our judges have already moved to um, a private space to deliberate the winners. Um, so in the meantime, I'll take the opportunity while everyone's here and while they continue to make that decision, we're going to welcome questions to uh, from the audience, both Zoom and in person, for our presenters. And we invite you to ask really anything about their research or even their three-minute experience in general. So for those in the space, um, just raise your hand or those on Zoom, just post a question in the chat and we're gonna try to address as many as we can. Any questions for our presenters? I can maybe start us off with a general break the ice question. So maybe to all our participants, whoever would like to share, what do you find, what did you find to be the most challenging aspect of this competition and how did you overcome it? Any participants who would like to answer that question, you can come on up. There's a mic right here, right where you gave your presentation. You'll be very familiar with that X. Just yep. It's a long journey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, hi. Uh, so, uh, the most challenging aspect, not the tallest, <laughs> the, the most challenging aspect of 3MT was the fact that you have to pick and choose what you're going to include and what you're going to exclude. Because when you're doing your research, everything feels super important to you, but it's not necessarily the most important to express what the significance of your research is going to be. Thanks, Anya. Any questions from our audience? Yeah. So I, I want to ask the participants uh, how the preparation uh, for this experience, whether it has changed your the way that you think about your research. We have a volunteer participant to answer the question who'd like to come on up. Thanks, Joe. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I was just having pizza. Uh, <laughs> it's great, by the way, who are here. Uh, so I think like preparing for the script and preparing I'm thinking about what my research, how it makes an impact for the society. It really, really helps me to understand why my research is important. I always thought like, oh, nature and nurture things are cool. That's what I'm studying. But I also find out that actually what I study in a way can help marketers develop inclusive product uh, for like with potential at the same time can help to transform the society more gender inclusive. So I feel like by preparing those scripts and keep thinking about the impact of my research, it actually 
helps to understand my research better. And I feel that, oh, I'm proud I'm doing something like this that can make an impact for the world, hopefully. Yes. Thank you. Other questions from our audience? What was there something you particularly enjoyed about this process that you feel is something good you take with you or would share with somebody else who hasn't done it yet? Any participants like to tackle that one? You can head right on up to the mic. So I feel like the skills in terms of how to like carry yourself and present yourself was one thing that was really helpful. So I mean, a lot of the times you're talking in your research, but you're not necessarily talking to people outside of your field and the way that you hold your body and the way that you communicate kind of has to change with that. So that was nice to also get coaching from like our group to then be like, oh, this is how maybe we should animate more or also for then, um, like just the camaraderie in the group as well and seeing how we can explain to each other, like someone from engineering to health to social. Yeah. Thank you. More questions. Yeah. Can I ask a, for my participant? Okay. Uh, Steven, I would like to know how your research is related to brain, brain plasticity, if it is at all. Do you want to still come to the front, Stephen, even if there is a mic so that the Zoom audience can also see you? There's one up there for you. Look at that. Um, hi. Um, yes, it is. Um, so, the tricky part to answer in this question is it depends on how you look at what I'm actually doing. But um, but in terms of chronic pain, especially, it's uh, a way to rewire the brain and the neuroplasticity of the brain. So we're actually training uh, over the course of using it over time. This is the hope, I guess, not what I'm actually physically doing um, to rewire the brain for uh, how it processes pain. So it doesn't really receive the signals as strongly and more the people who are in chronic pain that um, in that pain spasm cycle where they're constantly ruminating over it, it's a way to kind of uh, mitigate and deal with it uh, over time. But yes. Thank you. I'll maybe throw another one out there. What advice would any of you give to people who are interested in participating in 3MT in the future, but are maybe hesitant because they fear public speaking or are a bit shy or just think they're not ready to do something like this? First of all, thank you for this because it was really great experience having this. Uh, for the participants in the future who wants to um, take a part in, I would like to say it is really, really, um, you know, testing your skills kind of thing because even though you have your research in different domains, but to explain that in a general people, it is very, very like, it's, it's very tough, but not in a way like just crafting a speech is a tough. And also, People are, if even if you make your speech in a in an easy way, people are always tend to relate the things. Like for example, if I speak about plastic, a uh, lot of people can relate it, but a lot of cannot. Or let's say if uh, Stephen said about virtual reality, but some people might like, I don't care. So it's like it's very subjective to the people, and 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 in a, in a that way, you still have to make a speech in a way that you can attract all of them. So um, so it is really challenging, but at the same time interesting. So anybody who wish to part, take part in future, I would say, please do it because I know you might fear initially, but once you do it, you would definitely feel good. So yeah, go for that. Thank you. <laughs> Nicely said. Any other questions? Yeah, you're gonna wait. Oh, you wanna answer? Yeah, come on up. Okay. <laughs> So 
So for anyone out there that's thinking about it, the really interesting and cool thing about this is probably 99% of the presentations you do, you're going to have some sort of prompts, whether it's slides, whether it's uh, cue cards. This was such an interesting experience because you have three minutes and if you go blank, you have nothing to help you kind of ground yourself again. Um, and so it's it's a really cool way to like get to the depth of actually understanding what you're actually doing and being able to articulate it to people. Um, and then the other side of it too is it's meant for a layman audience. So really like taking the details of your information and sharing it really clearly is so difficult for many people in different fields. So it's just a really cool experience. So definitely recommend it. Thank you. Anyone else want to share um, response to that answer or any other questions? I also want to encourage the Zoom audience if they do have questions to put it in the chat. There is a question. I can read it out. Question for Abu Asali. What was your, there you go. Your, there he is. Okay. I'll read it out now. What was your expected outcome before you started your research and did that match? Uh, thank you for the question. I don't know whoever posted it, but yeah, the first thing about your research, you shouldn't come with any pre-assumptions, right? Then your whole research is viable. So I came with a really thin slate of mine, but yeah, again, being a Bangladeshi individual myself, Bangladeshi man myself, this man, there was a bit of tension how I could translate their, my participants' views and assumption into my research. So from my positionality, what I tried is to be as blank as possible while analyzing their views, as well as I'm not going into jargon, but I tried following all the protocols of qualitative research to ensure that my any of my view doesn't reflect on the research. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on Zoom? No. Any other questions in the room? I'll follow up maybe with another one then. Um, what motivated you to participate in 3MG um, competition this year? Like what brought you here? I heard about the 3MT from a friend and of course it sounds like a fun competition so I wanted to join but uh, more importantly I wanted to test myself to see if I could communicate my research uh, and that would kind of help guide me to decide what kind of career I would like in the future obviously if this didn't go very well I probably wouldn't do anything that required communicating my research <laughs> so that was a little bit of a test for myself. Thank you. question want to come up now. Yeah. <laughs> oh I finally get on the stage yeah. uh, I have a question for Jeremy so you it's so interesting because uh, you're right even for me in my clinical practice if someone had a concussion especially uh, kids or teenagers you always said keep them in a dark room keep them away from lights and you basically almost want to sort of sedate someone without sedating them the idea of exercise is really interesting do you find that people have difficulty almost saying, oh, wait, I'm willing to consider this because it's so different than, what, than what's been recommended before? Or is there, or I'm just curious about how you find how people react to that. Well, they don't really know about it. That's the thing, it's still new. So doctors aren't really learning much, or at least they, they might not be learning much about concussions uh after graduating or getting their medical de medical degree so they're not really telling their patients to go exercise a lot of them are still saying go rest in a dark room so uh not many people are doing this and that's part of the the research is to bring awareness to it thanks sir Any other questions? It seems like the judges are almost ready to um, share their decisions with us. 
So any questions you have about the participants, whether it be 3MD, but also about the research? And participants, if you have questions for each other, um, feel free as well. Yeah, so. Oh, OK, yeah. <laughs> Let me get your mic. I guess. <laughs> I will repeat my question. I have a question for Maxime. So my question is, you participated in 3MT two years ago. Now yeah. you're a coach for 3MT. How, like, how do you your feeling change from a participant to a coach? I'll step to this, Mike. <laughs> um, I don't know if change is the right word, but it's developed into something that I truly enjoy. So I think through the 3MT competition, I really found presentation and like just communicating and disseminating knowledge to be something that I find exciting and I value. And through coaching, I also realize I find exciting to hear it from others and to, to process and to really get to know other, what other people are doing, what passions, what, what's passionate about them. This like coming together of all these different fields, I find pretty cool. And um, so that changed, but they go hand in hand. It was kind of, to me, a a nice transition from being a participant to now uh, coaching and working with all of you and I'm seeing, I'm gonna stop doing this now. <laughs> Any other questions? How do you plan to apply these skills? So, um, like in kind of inspired by the question I just got asked, how do you plan to apply these skills that you've developed through this 3MT experience in other aspects of your life, um, maybe beyond your research, beyond your academic path? Anybody? <laughs> Nikki's coming up. Um, so I, I know for me personally, um, I do have to, like in the field at work, you have to communicate with people that don't really necessarily have the same expertise, right? Uh, so I already find it a little helpful to be able to, um, I don't know, make um, connections that mm -hmm. people will understand. So. That's really nice. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, you want to come up and ask a question? Oh, or someone can bring it in. So um, we talked a little bit about how the skills that you developed in this experience. So maybe how would you describe this experience in a job interview or on a job application um, or even use this pitch in uh, when someone asks you about your research? So in a in a job interview, I think what this really allows you to do is express really complicated ideas in really, really simple terms. So you distill things down, and that means that you're really good at communicating, you're able to express things with other people, but it also means that when you're able to do that, you have to be able to listen to what other people are telling you so that you know how to include the most pertinent piece of information that someone's response. So I think those are some of the skills that you can utilize from here when you're in the job interview, but also when you're at work. Thanks. Any other thoughts that you'd like to share just about your experience in general? Final parting words <laughs> from any of the participants? Or even the guest coaches, if there are in the room.
But maybe I'll ask another question um, that I've asked before, but I really found the answer to be quite sure, maybe not. <laughs> um, well, sure. I'm, I'm going to put Angelica back on the spot because I really find uh, BFR training um, um, pretty cool. And a question that we talked about briefly, but I appreciated your answer was uh, you mentioned how it can be used for people who for who lifting heavy weights can be more challenging or dangerous. And I'm wondering for people in rehab, is it something that can facilitate or speed up the process? A hundred percent. So people who are in like a rehabilitation process, using BFR can build their confidence because well, they can't lift heavy right away. So if they're doing things like BFR, it helps them to build that confidence, to build that muscle and uh, to basically get stronger, faster and feel feel better and get back to their daily lives ASAP. So yeah, thanks for the question. Thanks. It seems like we're just about ready to announce the winners. Um, so before I do give the floor to the judges, let's give our participants one final round of applause for their presentation. You should, you should really truly be proud of the work you've done and the skills that you've developed through this process. And it's um, I mean it when I say congratulations to all of you. We'll start with the announcement of the master's award, followed by the winner of the doctoral category and end with the people's choice. So I'm gonna invite Alexis. Yeah, I'm gonna okay, you're doing okay. So I'm gonna invite Mamoun Medraj for to announce up to the front to announce the recipient of the master's award, please. Good afternoon, everybody. It's true, we are gonna select only one, but I have to say it was heartwarming to listen to all of you. You did amazing. To me, all of you were winners, but unfortunately we have to select only one. And the one selected by the judges is Angelica Gnanan Parakasam. <laughs> Congratulations. You're doing pictures? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to invite Alexis Gateman uh, to come up to the front now to announce the doctoral winner. This was so humbling and I've learned so much. So thank you for the privilege of allowing me to be here. Um, we were joking in the back about all the little snippets that we've learned from all of you. It's been wonderful. Um, I'm never going to look at ballet again the same way. So Emma, congratulations. Congrats. For the people's choice, I am going to ask for a little break um, because we haven't quite finished tallying the votes right now. So let's take another beat and I'll call you back once those votes are tallied and we have the final decision on the people's choice. All right. Thanks for your patience. can see obviously there's a bit of uh thank you for voting in the chat we're gonna try and tally that up and compare it against what we had on the form um but as you can see there's some things happening we'll get back to you in a minute
All right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Sammy Lee now if you would please like to join me in the front to announce the People's Choice Award. Thank you, Maxime. Um, well, I'm just going to say a couple of words. Is that I I'm really impressed by your work. I'm also impressed by uh, your contribution to this world because in this world we need researchers, and uh, so so I think uh, I applaud you. Um, just one thing, are you attending a wedding tonight? If you're not, you may want to consider going to a wedding so that you can do your three minute thesis over and over again to every single guest because that that's how I tried to do. We went to a wedding and we asked, sir, nice to meet you. Do you have three minutes? And let me tell you about my thesis. And uh, I guess it just got better. So uh, here I'm, to, I'm here to announce the winner of the People's Choice Award. Um, Manali Patel. <laughs> Congratulations, Manali. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to our winners. Um, thank you to again to all our participants for sharing your research with us. We'd also like to thank the judges for generously offering their time, accepting the challenge. Um, their, sorry, the judges and for um, their gener generously offering their time and accepting this challenge of choosing the winners. A special thanks to our coaches and guest coaches over the course of the competition: Maria Quirez, Gina Beltran, and Paul Savari. And a huge thank you to Javier Bibara Isasi, working behind the scenes from the beginning to make this whole thing possible. I wanna thank you, the audience, for being with us to really encourage the innovative research being done here at Concordia University and to Fourth Space for their generous support and hosting of yet another successful um, event. I will now pass it back to Doug from Fourth Space to guide you through our closing remarks. And I want to wish you all a wonderful evening, everybody. It was an absolute pleasure to be your MC for today. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you, everyone, uh, for jumping, coming into Force Space today, participating in this, voting, doing everything you can. And uh, our apologies for the mess up with the form, but uh, we were able to tabulate the, uh, the votes behind the scenes. So thanks for that. We're going to be closing up the Zoom and the live stream now. Just a quick reminder that this conversation remains available on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to revisit, share it, and please join us again. Have a fantastic weekend.